in Peter chapter 3, looking at the first nine verses together this morning. The title of our study is The Promise of Jesus' Coming. The Promise of Jesus' Coming. Now, there are some today, uh, even within mainstream Christianity, that don't believe that Jesus is going to return. However, there's a lot more outside of Christianity that don't believe Jesus is coming back. Um, and they, they really scoff at the idea that he's going to come back. They believe he was a real person and that he died, um, but that's about it. And they don't want to they don't, don't look into it any further. Um, but we know that Jesus is real, that he did die on the cross for our sins, was buried and rose again, right? the gospel message. And we also know that he's coming back. All right? He said, I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am, you will be with me. And we know that there's a moment that uh, uh, we see in 1 Thessalonians 4, in the twinkling of an eye, that the church will be with the Lord, um, that we'll be united with Him. Um, and that's something we should be looking forward to. In fact, it says there in 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4, Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Right? Because being with the Lord is much better than anything else. Right? We can be with Him forever. And so today we'll see that, that Peter warns his readers and us to understand uh, that we can trust in the Lord. And he gives us these three important facts about God and the promise of Jesus' return. In verses 1 through 4, we'll see that God's word is true. Uh, verses 5 through 7, we'll see God's work is consistent. And then lastly, verses 8 through 9, we'll see God's will is merciful. Now again, when we talk about the coming of Christ, there are those who think things continue on as they always have. Uh, I think as humans, there's a part of us that don't like change. And you've probably heard about some of the recent closings in our community about stores. And you've probably seen it nationally. The company has gone bankrupt. Um, that's just a part of life. And yet, there's, for some reason, we don't like change. Right? We like to go to the same restaurant, sit in the same seat, order the same thing. Um, we don't venture out, you know, once we get comfortable, we'd like to stay there. Um, and the same can be true spiritually, right? We want to think the same things. We don't want to uh, maybe look at things from a different perspective or maybe look into it deeper. Um, we don't want to share that with other people. We just kind of want to be in our holy huddle, our Christian bubble, and keep to ourselves. And Peter's going to encourage us to... to Make sure we understand that God can intervene in human history. That God is still performing miracles today. Uh, and that God wants to continue uh, to have us look at Him. Not look at what's going on in the world, uh, but keep our eyes on Him. And, and as we look at what's going on in the world, that we should be praying right, for all the events. Pray for the leader of North Korea. Pray for our community that it prospers. Uh, pray for our men and women in, in uniform. Pray for our president. Pray for those in leadership. Um, you know, that's something that we should be doing all the time. But most importantly, we need to keep our eyes on the Lord. He's the one who's in control. He holds it all together. And he's the one that we can trust. So we'll see Peter uh, deals with that as well. So Second Peter chapter 3. Uh, let's take a look at the first four verses here. Uh, he says, Beloved, I now write to you, this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your per pure minds by the way of reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and at the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Peter tells us that he wrote this letter, the second letter, as he did in the first one, to stir us up, to remind us of God's truth, of God's promises. He wants us to be awakened, to be aroused to God's truth. And the word stir up here in verse 1 literally means to awaken your memory. That word stir up reminds me, uh, if you've ever been camping before and you've had a fire 
and after a while those logs burn out, there's coals there. You can grab a stick and you can stir it up. And as you do that, you'll find that it comes back to life, right? There, there's heat and there's enough there that you can get a fire going again. And that's the picture here that is at times we can be forgetful, um, that we can lose sight of God's promises. We can continually ask God, why, why? Instead of going, Lord, thank you, you're with me. I'm going to cling to your promise. So we need to be stirred up to remember uh, of who the God is and what he has done for us and what we can trust in, the promises that he has. Again, sometimes it's easy for us as Christians to get accustomed to God's truth. I'm reminded in uh, Acts chapter 20 of a guy named Eutychus. He was there listening to Paul preach and teach and was probably enjoying it. And they began to kind of fall asleep. And then before long, he fell out the window. And we don't want that to happen to us where we hear God's word. We hear the truth so often that we're kind of like, okay, I've heard this before. Blah, blah, blah. Let's get through this. Um, and we can sometimes do that with our daily devotion. Like, oh, all right, I got to get through this chapter of the Bible again. And then I got other things planned to do today. And God's saying, no, 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 slow down. I want to connect with you. I want to have a heart to heart with you. Let's, let's utilize this time for refreshment and encouragement, not just to check it off the list. So we want to make sure that we're uh, listening and paying attention to God's word because it's true and it's a message that should be taken very seriously. The word of God must awaken us to live godly lives and seek to win the loss to Jesus Christ. And in verse 2 here, we see that he tells us that we may be mindful of the words which were spoken. That means that we're to recall or remember. And Peter's kind of got this theme going on here that, again, we're supposed to remember what God has done. And it's hard to know what God has done if you don't know the Word of God. It's hard to trust in the promises if you don't know what the promises are. Again, that's a good encouragement for us to be Bible students, to make sure we know the Word of God, that we're reading in context the Bible, that we have a Bible reading plan, we're getting through God's Word, uh, you know, chapter by chapter, book by book. And that as we find those promises in the scripture, we can underline them, we can highlight them, we can write them in our, our daily journal uh, and cling to those promises. Because what God says is true, you can take it to the bank. Not one word of our Lord has ever failed. We can trust in what he has for us. So we're to remember what the Bible says. And also we're to remember what the Bible says about the day of the Lord. The prophets taught it, so did our Lord Jesus Christ. And there's unity throughout the Word of God. Uh, we see this from the prophetic Old Testament books, the teaching of our Lord and the Gospels, and the writing of the Apostles in the New Testament. Uh, that God uh, is our Lord and Savior, and that there is a time where He will come back. But verse 3 tells us that scoffers deny the power and the coming of Jesus Christ. Essentially, they deny the truth of who God is and what He desires to do. And these scoffers or mockers are those who treat lightly that which ought to be taken seriously. Now, you remember the people of Noah's day, they scoffed, they mocked at the idea of a global flood, that God was going to judge the world. And they had to find out the hard way, right? That God means what He says, and He says what He means. And um, they didn't think there'd be a judgment. We also see this at the citizens of Sodom. They scoffed at the possibility of fire and brimstone destroying their city. And no doubt if you've ever tried to share your faith with an unbeliever, you've probably ran into those that have said, I'm a sinner? Yeah, I don't think so. Or, God wouldn't send anyone to hell. I mean, come on. God's a God of love. He wants everyone to go to heaven. And they mock the idea that if they don't, put their faith and trust in Christ, that they're going to end up separated from Him. But that's what the Scripture teaches us, right? That we have to repent from our sins, turn away from our lifestyle of evil, and come to the Lord, right? Receive Him by faith, by trust. Receive the grace of God. Put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone. And so, we want to make sure that we're seeking the Lord and... Uh, and maybe you're wondering, why do people mock God? Well, Peter tells us here in verse 4, 
Um, and the end of verse 3 as well, that they're walking according to their own lust. Um, and they're saying, where's the promise of His coming? He's telling us that they're mocking the Lord because of their lifestyle. They're enjoying the way that they're living. Um, and they want to continue living in their sins. They don't like the Word of God. Now, if your lifestyle contradicts the Word of God, you've got a couple options. One is you change your lifestyle. You submit to the Lord, right? You receive that correction, and you allow the Lord to do that work in your heart and work through you. The second is you begin to change the Word of God. Well, that's not really what the Bible says, or that's your interpretation, or, you know, well, in my case, God will excuse it. He's okay with that. Or you just deny, well, you know, that was written by men. The other part in red was Jesus, but not that part. And people do that because they justify their sin. Rather than allow God's Word to change them, they want to change the Word of God. And so people uh, don't want to believe because they don't want to change. And they will scoff at the doctrines of judgment and the coming of the Lord. But no matter what they claim, God's day of judgment will come on the world. And Jesus Christ will return and establish His glorious kingdom. Peter's remind us that God's word can still be trusted, that God's word is true. In fact, Jesus said that um, every jot and every tittle, uh, which is like for us in English, that's every crossing of the T and every dot of the I, will be fulfilled. There's not one word in Scripture that will fail. That everything that is written for us will come to pass. And in fact, there's a scripture in the Old Testament about Damascus being destroyed in a day. And we're starting to see a lot of things going on uh, up there in Syria. And you begin to wonder, are we going to see that in our lifetime or is that going to happen later? We're not certain, but we know it will happen, right? That God's word will be accomplished. And so we look to him. But we know that God's word is true. It's trustworthy. And Peter illustrates this point next with two examples of God working in our world in verses 5 through 7. He says here in verse 5, For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Peter begins to give us some illustrations here. Um, and you, you can kind of see his heart. How does he refute those scoffers and those who would mock the Lord? He simply reminds them of what God has already done in the past. And sometimes we need that reminder. We go through a circumstance, we go, Lord, I don't know how... I'm going to get through this. I don't know how I'm going to you know, face this situation. And we need to go back and remember, Lord, you've been so faithful. Every circumstance of my life, you have been there. You've never let me alone. You've never let me down. You're always faithful, and I can trust you. Why should this circumstance be any different? Why should this time catch you by surprise? No, God is, God is faithful. And we need to go back and remember all the things that he's done for us. And often you see in the Old Testament, they would set up memorial stones just for that purpose. So they wouldn't forget. Or they'd have the festivals. So the kids in the future generations would ask, why do we celebrate this? They could go back and, and look at God's deliverance and what God had done for His people. So Peter uh, reminds them and us of what God's done in the past to prove His work is consistent throughout the ages. And Peter simply presented evidence that those deliberately ignored Willfully forget here in verse 5 means to deliberately choose to overlook, suppress, or ignore this fact. It's amazing how so-called thinkers, uh, scientists, liberal philosophers, uh, theologians, will be selective and deliberately refuse to consider data. Now, history, and in fact the scientific history of our world, 
is there. There's no refuting, right, the layers and, and all the things that we see uh, when you begin to excavate and dig into the ground. But depending on your worldview, you may have a different interpretation, right? Maybe millions of years or a younger Earth. Um, and so looking at that really will determine your outlook. And so these guys, uh, a lot of these um, so-called thinkers, uh, have a preconceived idea that they want to uh, you know, push into what they're looking at. Or they'll ignore certain things. You probably heard a couple years ago that they found some dinosaur bones. And they didn't want people to know that they also found DNA and bone marrow in the dinosaur bone. And if that was millions and billions of years old, how would that be possible? So they deliberately chose to ignore that information. Now, that's what Peter is saying here, that people are being selective. They're deliberately refusing to consider certain things that God has done. And so Peter cites these two events in history to prove his point. The work of creation, we see that in verse 5, and the global flood in Noah's day in verse 6. The first one here in verse 5, the work of God at creation. The first example is that God created the heavens and the earth by his word. Can you imagine being there when God's speaking everything into existence? God said, let there be light. And whew, there was light. I mean, just the words flying out of his mouth, creating everything, would be amazing. Uh, we probably wouldn't want to get in the way uh, because <laughs> it would be destroyed. But the power of Almighty God to speak everything into existence. And here we see that God is in control. In fact, in the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, and you look at the creation there, uh, God said occurs nine times. When God says, it happens. When God speaks, He gets what He wants. Right? It accomplishes what His Word goes forth to do. And so God spoke the entire universe into existence. And we're told not only was creation made by the Word of God, but it's held together by that same Word. God's word is powerful. It's life-changing and transforming. It's active. Again, you can read any other book. Read a magazine, whatever. Read it again and again. You're not going to get really anything out of it. You do that with God's word, man, it's alive. You continually to get stuff out of it. It continues to change and transform your heart. Because it's active. His word is alive. And it accomplishes that work that God wants to do in our hearts. Now, I found this fascinating that every culture in our world has a creation story. Some are more aligned with the Bible and others are not. Uh, but they all basically say an outside power created us and every living thing in the world. And it really goes in contrast to modern atheism, which is really a recent invention of man. That everything came from nothing, which is a scientific impossibility. Right? It's like opening up the fridge and saying, I just know something's going to appear in there and it's going to be good food. Or you look at your bank account and you go, I know just somehow money's going to appear in there. No, that's a scientific impossibility, right? Something can't come from nothing. So everything around us came from someone. It came from God. God spoke it into existence. And not only that, but God's the one who created us and the whole world by his word. He intervenes in this world and He cares about each one of us, which is why He sent Jesus Christ to come to this earth, live that perfect sinless life we could never live, to humbly die on the cross for our sins where He shed His life's blood, was buried and rose from the dead. He cares about us. Now the second event Peter cites here in verse 6 is the global flood in Noah's day. This flood was uh, over the entire world. Uh, it was cataclysmic. In fact, the Greek word here in verse 6, for flooded or overflows, gives us our English word of cataclysmic. Saying that it was global. It wasn't just a local flood. This was a worldwide uh, devastation upon the face of the earth. This changed the landscape of our planet. And the earth had rained like it never rained before. And we're told the fountains of the deep were broken up. Now, if you were here and you saw the lightning of the rainstorm last night, it was kind of a free fireworks show in the sky, if you will. You heard the thunder 
And all of that power, right, the raw power of the storm, that was nothing compared to the global flood. And it's just a sliver of the power of our God. I mean, it's amazing the power of a lightning bolt coming down and and that roar of the thunder. But that's nothing compared to our God. He is so much more powerful, so much more awesome. And, And so he created us, but he also... Um, made this global flood to start over. And this is also fascinating. There are over 300 flood stories in many cultures around the world, including Native Americans, uh, Chinese, Australians, and the Middle East, the Mesopotamia, and the Greek cultures there, uh, even the German culture. And the list goes on and on. All these cultures have a flood story uh, because they realize it happened. Now, again, not all of them align with Scripture, but it's pretty fascinating that in just about all of them, there's eight people that survive this flood, which is fascinating. Now, being Native American, um, you know, I, when I grew up, my mom would share stories. Uh, one was that Native Americans survived on the back of a turtle. There were eight people. Or the other one where it was a, a giant um, peace pipe that they floated on this piece of wood. Um, again, I think it's awesome that that God's word gives us the answer. That there was this giant boat, this giant ark that was prepared. And God had people in there and animals in there. And they were preserved, right? By the obedience of man unto the Lord. And here we're told that we are preserved by the Lord. uh, By that same word. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in Noah's day and our day, there are scoffers. Those who say, everything is going to continue as it's always continued. And I'm sure in Noah's day, there were people say, it's never rain, it's never flooded, you're crazy building this boat away from the sea. Uh, you know, man, you've lost it. And there are those today who say, everything continues, you know, eat, drink, be merry, you don't need to believe in God, there's no afterlife, when you're dead, you're just dead, you guys are crazy, you're wasting your time. Um, and yet, those people that were mocking Noah, they found out the hard way, right? That there is a God, and that what he does say comes to pass. And, uh, you know, they would say life is uniform. Nothing unusual will happen, but it did happen. Uh, God broke into history, right? He, he came in and accomplished his will. God can send rain from heaven or fire from heaven. In fact, when you study the scriptures, you see there's so many times where God steps in and does a miracle. And you think, how is that possible? It's called a miracle. <laughs> there's no scientific explanation for it, right? And even, even the birth of a baby, still today, scientifically, uh, they're trying to figure out how does this happen? You know, they know the, the genetics of it, but when you go down before that, how does that life begin? They still can't figure that out. It's because it's a miracle. That life is precious. And so God intervenes into human history. And Peter's using these two illustrations to make his point here in verse 7. That the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. We're told that the same word that created us sustains us. And He is holding the world together. And that our Lord is preserving this world one day for judgment. Again, that's not a topic that we always like to talk about, especially in the church. It's a topic that you often don't hear about anymore. um, Because it's it's not one of those touchy, feel-good subjects, right? Uh, But that's what God's Word teaches. He teaches that there's going to be a day of judgment. And a day of judgment upon this world as well. And so God told us in Genesis 9 that he would no longer uh, send a flood to destroy the world. But he does tell us that the next judgment will be one of fire. And we'll get into that more next week as we finish up chapter 3. We'll see that in detail. um, About the elements will be melted with fervent heat. But Peter's main point here is that we would seek to remember that God is consistent. God does not change. The book of Hebrews tells us He's the same yesterday, today, 
and forever. The God who works miracles in the Old Testament still works miracles today. In fact, all of us coming to Christ is a miracle. (laughs) When you really stop and think about it, we were dead in our sins and trespasses, heading the wrong way, and God's Spirit wooed us to Him, and we put our faith and trust in Him, and and we're born again. I mean, that's, that's a miracle. And so, God's still performing miracles today. We've heard of people being healed. We've heard of people coming to Christ. Uh, the list goes on and on. Just amazing what, what God is continuing to do. So, God doesn't change. Uh, he intervenes in history to change this world. Uh, and Peter will tell us next why. He'll remind us that God's character also doesn't change, that He remains merciful. But He'll tell us why that's the case We see that here in verses 8 through 9, that God's will is merciful. He says here in verse 8, But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, But he's long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's God's heart. That's God's desire, right? Is that none would perish, but all would come to repentance. And so we want to make sure that we realize that. And once again, Peter's saying that, that these scoffers, these mockers, um, they don't understand the character, the nature of God. That he is consistent throughout the scriptures. Sometimes you hear people say that the God of the Old Testament is an angry God. He's, uh, you know, wrathful and judgmental. The God of the New Testament is God is of mercy and love and peace, and He would never hurt anyone. But when you look through the entire scripture, you realize God's consistent. The God that struck down Ananias and Sapphira in the Book of Acts, right, for lying and trying to deceive others and really the Holy Spirit, is the same God of the Old Testament. The God of the New Testament is the God of love, is the same God in the Old Testament, who's merciful, willing to forgive, slow to anger, and abounding in love, providing a way of escape through this ark, right? Desiring His people to be rescued and delivered. And He's patient, right? God is patient with us. So, these scoffers were making a God in their own image. A God that was not eternal. I've been asked by my kids and and others before, uh, who created God? And it's a good question because, you know, when you're younger, you're thinking logically that I was created, right? My parents were created. Everything around me is created. I can create stuff with my hands. Therefore, who created God? And the answer is, no one. He's always existed. He has no beginning. He has no end. He's the Alpha and Omega. He's the one who created time. He's outside of time. And so, He's different than us. Uh, and sometimes that's hard for kids to understand. And, uh, and it should be hard for us to understand sometimes. It shouldn't blow our mind. Because God's a big God. If we could figure Him out and put Him all in a box, He wouldn't be God. right? There are things that should cause us to be fearful and reverent and and just in awe of who God is, the way that He works and His character. Um, And so God is a God who has no beginning and no ending. Mankind, we have a beginning and we we have a earthly body ending, but the spiritual side of us will live forever, eternity, right? Either with the Lord in heaven or apart from Him forever in a place called hell which was created for the devil and the fallen angels. And so we're eternal beings in that sense. Not that we're going to you know, live in a glorified state apart from the Lord, but if we put our faith and trust in Him, we will have a glorified body with the Lord forever. And there's something within us, uh, it says this in Ecclesiastes, that we have this eternity put in our hearts. All of us desire to live forever. There's a point in our life where we start realizing our own mortality. That one day, we're not going to be here. We're going to cease to exist. That our heart's going to give out. We're going to have our last breath. And that's it. And 
there's a part of it that says, I don't want to. I want to keep going on, right? I want to live forever. And that's because God's put that within us. That he wants us to connect with him and, and enjoy that relationship with him forever. So, God is eternal. Without beginning or ending, he dwells in eternity. He has always been, he will always be God. And here in verse 8, Peter is probably referring back to Psalm 90, verse 4, which says, For a thousand years in your sight, God, are but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. So Peter's reminding us here that a thousand years are as one day to the Lord. And that we really shouldn't accuse God of delayed fulfillment of His promises. God will accomplish His will and, and His timing. Uh, he will work according to His schedule. And according to God's sight, the whole universe is only really a few days old, right? He's not limited to the time the way we are, nor does He measure it according to man's standards. And when, again, when you study the Scriptures, uh, you study the works of God, and you see this in the Old Testament as well, you see He's never in a hurry. But he's also never late, right? He intervenes just at the right time. right? When Moses is there with the people at the Red Sea and they're freaking out, what do we do? What do we do? It looks like there's all hope is lost. What happens? God intervenes right on time, right? Not before, not late, but right when he's supposed to be there. Because God's in control. And it's reminded me that sometimes we're in a hurry with God. <laughs> God, hurry up. Come on. I've been waiting. I've been praying on this. Hurry up. Or we think, man, God, you're late. I mean, come on. You, you missed the boat here. And God says, no, I didn't. I'm accomplishing my purpose. Slow down. Be patient. Just wait on me. And you think about it. God could have created the entire universe in an instant. Yet he chose to do it in six literal 24-hour days. And the seventh day to rest and set it apart as holy. God could accomplish what he wanted to deliver his people, Israel, from Egypt in a moment. Yet he desired to invest 80 years into Moses to train him to, to lead the people out of Egypt. And you see this throughout the scriptures. That God could have also sent the Savior much sooner. But Galatians 4 tells us, He waited until the fullness of time was come. God works in time, but He's not limited to time like we are. And God's timing is always perfect. We need to trust in that. To God, 1,000 years is as one day. And one day is 1,000 years. God can accomplish in one day what it would take others a millennium to accomplish. He waits to work. But once he begins to work, he gets things done. And again, for me, that's a reminder of how we need to be patient and wait upon the Lord, to trust in his perfect timing and provision. Again, we want things now. <laughs> we want things the way we want things. But last I checked, we're not in control. God doesn't check in with us and say, hey, what do you think about this today? I'm thinking about doing this, and I just want to run this past you and get your input. God doesn't do that, right? He's the one who's in control. Uh, he's the one who's running the show. And we can trust. He knows what he's doing. Uh, he's a God that's trustworthy and loyal. A God who is faithful. And so, the scoffers didn't understand God's timing, nor did they understand his mercy. Which is why God delayed the coming of Christ in the day of the Lord. And we're told in verse 9, it's not because God was unable to act or unwilling to act as some uh, attribute to God but that he is a God of love not willing any perish uh, God is not tardy or off schedule you've probably heard people say well if God is all loving and all powerful wouldn't he put an end to, to suffering and sin in the world and they wrestle with that well maybe he's all powerful he could but he's not all loving so he lets it go on or maybe he's all loving, but he's not all powerful. He wants to do something, but he can't do something. And here we're told in Scripture, the reason is because he's not willing any perish. But that all would come to repentance. All would come to put their trust in him. 
He is waiting. He's merciful. He's being patient. And sometimes we need to learn that example. Uh, I've, I've had to do that as a parent with children. There are times where um, they can ruffle your feathers, so to speak, and you want to discipline right now. Right? I, want, I want things my way. And if you just slow down and are patient, things work them, th- themselves out. You give your kids an opportunity to say, you know, Dad, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. Please forgive me. Great. Much better. <laughs> and I think God's waiting for us the same way. Right? God could bring judgment to the earth whenever He wants. But I'm thankful He didn't do it 10 years ago, 20 years ago. I'm thankful that He's still waiting for people to come to Him. Many of us, uh, you know, we're thankful as well because we wouldn't have made it, right? Uh, but God waited for us. And God's still waiting for others to come to Him. And, and we want to have that heart towards those around us to see them come to Christ as well. So, God's delays uh, and the coming of Christ and the great day of judgment is because of His long suffering. God wants to give lost sinners every opportunity to be saved. There should be no question in anybody's mind whether God wants sinners to be saved. Verse 9 makes it very clear. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So, in closing, these verses give us both the negative and the positive. They assure us of God's love for all of mankind. And that God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. It says that in Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 23, verse 32, chapter 33, verse 11. And really throughout the scripture, right? That God is not willing that people perish. Uh, And you look at, you know, with Noah, the ark was built. And it was complete. And God waited seven days for people to get on the boat before he sent the flood. Imagine day one going out there and saying, All right, guys, the boat's ready. Come on on. You know, come and get in the boat. Oh, and it's not going to rain. Day two, you go back out there, like, Okay, guys, God's giving me another day. Come on, get on. And then day seven, you're right? like, Okay, another day. Here we go. All right, everyone, get on the boat. Ah, you know, you're, you've lost it. And okay, goes in and God shuts the door and then, Hey, it's starting to rain. Hey, let us in. You know, and it, it's that, that mindset that, that God is not willing any perish. In fact, this is one of the reasons that Jonah had such an issue with going to Nineveh, going to a Gentile nation and telling them to repent and, and look to the Lord. He said, no, I'm not going because you're merciful. You'll forgive them. And I don't want them to be forgiven. I'd rather, I'd rather you know, jump off the boat and drown than go tell them. God says, well, that's not really my heart. You know, I'll swallow you up with this great fish, and you'll be humbled. <laughs> and then when your heart is ready, you'll cry out to me. And it took him a couple days, which again shows he had some heart issues going on. If it was me, I'd been like instantly, Lord, help. But for him, it took him a couple days, right? And so finally, he says, okay, God, I'll go. And he goes. And then he's upset that the people are repenting, right? That they're humble before the Lord. He says, God, I knew you were merciful. I knew you wouldn't just destroy them off the face of the earth. And again, it's consistent with God's character. He's not willing any perish. And we shouldn't will that any perish either. Whether it's people in these Middle East countries, these Muslims and the terrorists, whether it's those in North Korea, uh, whether it's any of those people around the world that would seek to harm. We should be praying for their salvation. We should be praying for those... Saul of Tarsus's, who could become Paul's, right? We want to be interceding for their behalf. So God shows His mercy to all, even though not all will be saved. But to those who come to repentance, salvation is available. And the word repent simply means to change one's mind in such a way that it changes your, your life, your attitude, your direction. It's not regret, which is... Man, I'm sorry I got caught, or I'm sorry I did this. It's not remorse, which is, man, I feel really bad about what I did, and ah, I don't want to do that again. But repentance is a change of mind that results in the action of the will. It's doing a 180. It's an about face. You know what? I'm not going to head this direction. I'm going to turn around and head in this direction. It's surrendering your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, anyone who sincerely desires 
to come to the Lord, all they need to do is change their mind. They need to change their direction. And as they do that, they'll realize that God loves them, that God sent Jesus Christ to rescue them. And they turn to Him and trust in Him, they put their faith in Him, they'll be saved. Again, God does not want anyone to perish. This is why He sent His one and only Son, Jesus Christ, right? We're told this in John 3.16, For God so loved the world, He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the gospel in a nutshell, in that one single verse. That God's desire is that we would all be saved. And that should be our heart as well. As those around us, we want to see come to the Lord. We want to see them be rescued as well. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your love. Thank you so much for your forgiveness. Thank you, God, that your word is always true. That it's trustworthy. That in all your promises are yes and amen. That we can cling to your promises. We can hold on tightly and hold fast to the word of truth. We thank you that your work is consistent. That you are a God of mercy and love and forgiveness. But you're also a God of justice. A God of truth. A God that is fair. A God who is consistent. We thank you, Lord, that you have intervened in the history of mankind. That you stepped into time to rescue and redeem us. We thank you, Jesus, for coming to this earth, living that perfect sinless life we never could. That you died on the cross for our sins. That you shed your life's blood for us. That you were buried in that tomb with our sin, but you defeated the penalty of our sin, death, and you rose from the grave. We thank you, Lord, that you were merciful. From beginning to end, from Genesis to Revelation, you were a God of mercy. You were a God who's not willing that any perish, but all come to repentance. That all would turn towards you. They'd look to you. And they'd put their faith and trust in you. Lord, we pray that you'd help us to have that heart towards those around us. And Lord, if there be any here among us this morning who have yet to surrender their life to you, yet to say, yes, I need Jesus Christ, or perhaps listening to this message later online, who need to make that decision, that Lord, you'd be speaking to their heart, that by your Spirit, you'd be convicting them of their sin and their need for you, and convincing them of your love your amazing love and grace towards them. And if you're here this morning, say, Pastor Tim, pray for me. Pray with me. I need to give my life to Jesus. I simply want to encourage you to do that today. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer where you make that decision to surrender your life to the God who loves you, to the God who made you, and the God who knows you. And if you're ready to do that, I just want to encourage you to repeat this prayer after me and made it in your heart. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I realize that my sin separates me from you. And that, Jesus, you came to this earth. You lived a perfect, sinless life. A life that I never could. And that you went to the cross... You died on the cross for my sins. And that you shed your life's blood for me. That you were buried and rose from the grave. God, I ask that you'd forgive me of all my sins. That you'd come into my heart and into my life. That you'd be my Savior and my Lord. That from this day forward, I will follow you. God, I thank you for loving me. I thank you for knowing me. I thank you for forgiving me. And I thank you for being my Lord, my Savior, and my friend. And I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.